I share with you now our lesson from Acts. Acts 17, beginning with the 22nd verse. Hear now these words. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in the shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one another, from one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh, holy God, in these moments, speak to us. And may the words of my mouth and may all those thoughts resting upon our hearts and minds, may they all be acceptable to you. Amen. As already mentioned today, we begin a sermon series and free election kindness campaign titled, Love Your Neighbor. If you've already seen signs in people's yards, it's because quite a few United Methodist churches in East Ohio are participating in the campaign. The inspiration behind the campaign is the lack of kindness that is not only characterizing our current political discourse, but is also having an impact in so many areas of our society. There is a disturbing presence of anger, meanness, lies, divisive rhetoric, and hurtful actions that reflect what I think is best described as an absence of love. This disturbing presence has been fueling division for a while, but it certainly seems even worse as we approach a national election. Now, I'd like to think our gathering this morning as a community of Christians on World Communion Sunday stands in opposition to such dynamics. For today, we acknowledge and rejoice in the fact that we are members of a diverse, worldwide movement of Jesus followers who believe in a God who is described through scripture by the word love. To believe in a God who, is, who has so loved the world that he gave his only son is to not only rejoice in and receive this love, but it is also to embody this love. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now to follow Jesus is to take this great commandment to heart and to allow our daily thoughts and actions to be formed by that love. A love that is based not on feelings that come and go, but on actions determined to be in the best interest of others. Over the years, there are those who have said 
and those who continue to say today that religion is the primary source of much of the division, violence, bloodshed, and war our world has known. However, historians and researchers tell us something different. They say that religion has only been the primary motivating cause of war in about 8% of the time. So why such a distorted perspective? Well, unfortunately, even if not the primary cause, religion has often played a key role in fostering divisions in nations, among people. I was very much reminded of this reality during our Scotland trip that focused on the Presbyterian Re Reformation led in the 16th century by the Scottish minister and Reformed theologian, John Knox. This is considered to be the oldest picture of John and greater to his likeness than anything else. I took it when I was in Scotland. Knox was a man of passionate faith, and yet, and yet, I felt hard-pressed at times to find love in his words and actions. Throughout the centuries, violence, even if not war, has erupted too often in Christian history when the single-minded judgment of those deemed to be wrong has prevailed over love and mercy. Faith can divide us and instill greater fear and even hate. Faith can be part of the problem. Or it can be the antidote to hate as love brings us together and heals divisions. Today we are focusing on why and how our faith compels us to love our neighbors across divide across those differences. As human beings, we seem wired to focus on our disagreements and differences. Bring five or six Christians of different denominations in a room and you will likely find plenty of disagreement. Consider Jesus' own disciples and how radically different some of them were in their thinking and in their politics. Jesus called both Matthew, the tax collector for Rome, and Simon, the Canaanian or zealot. That would have been like Jesus calling a diehard Republican Trump supporter and a Kamala Harris, never Trump Democrat, to both be numbered among his 12 disciples. Can you imagine the tension? Maybe you get it now. Is it any wonder why Jesus taught so much about being merciful, forgiving others, loving others, neighbors? Jesus knew, he understood about divisions. He knew his disciples and those who came after would tend to criticize and pick at one another. I think that's why Jesus famously said in the Sermon on the Mount, do not judge, so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own, you hypocrite? First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. This is powerful imagery. Why is it that we pick up that magnifying glass and tweezers so quickly to point out and remove someone else's eye splinter and yet ignore what is often a big problem existing in our own eyes? Clearly, Jesus knew that human nature leans in the direction of division and that love alone can keep us together. This love that Jesus taught and revealed compels us to see the best in others, to see what Jesus sees and to look for 
common ground. That's what Paul did when he stood on Mars Hill in Athens upon the Areopagus. And instead of criticizing their temples and all their many different altars to different gods and declaring judgment on them for their misguided understanding, the fact that they were wrong, he looked for and he found a way to respectfully bridge the differences. Paul knew that love is not about being right, but about doing what is helpful, what is best for others. Unfortunately, human nature being what it is, the first century Christians struggled to follow the Apostle Paul's example of focusing on and finding common ground. To read the New Testament, it's to come across lots of conflict and division. The disagreements are highlighted in Paul's letters to various first century churches. Those early churches, those members, argued over whether to eat meat sacrificed to idols or to stick only to vegetables to be safe. They argued over those who saw some days as more sacred than others. They argued that only certain baptisms were legitimate. And they argued whether a Gentile could even be a Christian. I sort of understand what Paul was dealing with in his letters. Because I've also been in the church for many years, and I've seen plenty of disagreements in the churches I've served over the past 38 years. And it's because it still happens that I am grateful for those who understand that Jesus did not call us to always agree with one another, but he did call us to always love one another. When Jesus looks at Christians today, I don't think he says, those United Methodists, they really please me. They've got, got it all right and everyone else doesn't. I think God looks at us as I look at my children. Emily and Ethan couldn't be more different, opposite in so many ways. But I love them both fiercely. Their differences make them unique and beautiful. And I think that's how God looks at churches. God sees the Pentecostal passion the sacramental devotion of Catholics, the Baptist emphasis on winning souls, and the Methodist passion for the connection of faith and good works. I think God says, they are all my children. I love them. And these siblings need each other. Such an open-mindedness and ecumenical spirit has always been who we are as Methodists. In a sermon titled, The Catholic Spirit, John Wesley listed many things we Christians don't agree on. There was a long list of things in those days. Many of them are the same, some are different. But he also said, although a difference in opinions or modes of worship may prevent an entire external union, yet need it prevent our union in affection? Though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike. May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Without all doubt, we may. Herein all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding these smaller differences. Unfortunately, you and I and most everyone else tend to overlook love, that common, powerful ground of love, and fixate instead on smaller differences. But love tells us that those who, who think we are right and others are wrong are likely wrong as often as we are right. God's love compels us to find common ground, to face our differences with humility, and to, above all, show love to others. 
This love is not a warm feeling, but it is an act of will. Yes, it might entail deep feelings of friendship, but it is based on actions that show kindness and offer concern. The defining characteristic of a Christian is not what we know or about being right, but about how much we love. Love compels us to search for the image of God in every person. Love focuses us not on what differentiates or divides us, but on what we have in common. Now certainly this love is hard to fully embrace. It is costly to practice and difficult to sustain, especially amid glaring differences, growing fears, flaring tempers. And yet the truth of this love is most clearly and fully revealed in the life and death of Jesus. This is the love we remember and celebrate and embrace for ourselves whenever we share in Holy Communion. To look upon Jesus is to see that choosing love over hate is not a life for the faint in heart or weak in spirit. But it is a life that is set free from fear in a way that allows us to live uniquely in this world. This love compels us to care for others, even those with whom we disagree. It compels us not to tear down others, but to build them up. Of course, it can be very difficult when differences are being emphasized to focus on that which we have in common. I realize that. It can be personally costly to stand up to fear and speak out against lies and hate, and it can also be costly to jump on board with friends when they are behaving badly. But to be a Christian is to embody the love of God revealed in Jesus. Now perhaps this all sounds too idealistic. I'm sure more than a few of you are thinking, it's not that easy, Pastor. And of course it's not. But let us at least begin by confronting the fears and forms of hate that have perhaps crept inside and are growing within us. We can do this only by keeping our eyes on Jesus, who showed us how to face with love the most difficult, hurtful people and life situations. This love allows us to see beyond our divisive human nature to that which we have in common. And it replaces, with the light of grace, the darkness in our lives, where suspicion and fear and anger and self-righteousness have taken hold. So, today, as you enter into Holy Communion, may you know the breadth, the depth, the length, the power of God's love for you and for all of your neighbors, near and far. As United Methodists, we believe the sacrament of communion is common ground, which means all are welcome to eat and to drink. Let us now prepare ourselves as we prepare to come to God in holy communion. I invite you to open up your hymnal that we might join together. <laughs> 